Hello DevOps people, welcome to Full Stack Live, my live coding stream. Happy to have you here, happy to be back. <laughs> I'm back from uh, a little holiday, I was away with my family. I was over in the west of Ireland to um, simply take some time off, relax, let the kids and even my wife uh, try horse riding and um, yeah we had a really good time even though the weather was quite terrible uh, it rained I think every day we've been there from from Monday to Friday this week so um, came back yesterday and I think it was raining every single day however that didn't um, keep us from uh, exploring the area and uh, using uh, the opportunity to uh, get riding lessons. Even my little seven-year-old did some uh, uh, riding on a pony and everyone had a lot of fun despite the weather. Now we're back here in the east of Ireland and uh, I just looked outside and it's raining again so I guess there is no way to escape the current Irish weather um, and uh, that's always an, a good opportunity to uh, start streaming again. How is everyone? I hope you're doing well. Um, I hope you're staying safe. Uh, things haven't changed so it's a good thing to uh, take care of each other. And um, yeah, today I'm going to do a little bit of um, Docker development because I'd like to, to write an article about how to properly um, Dockerize a Ruby on Rails application. So I thought, um, why not try this out and do this uh, basically from scratch on stream so you can build this thing with me. As always, if there is anything that you'd like to ask, please pop into Twitch chat. Let's make this an interactive show. Uh, I'd be I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. And um, I'm uh, I always appreciate your support and your recommendations. So don't be shy. And uh, if there's anything that you'd like to share, if there is anything you'd like to give me feedback on, don't hold back. All right. Yeah, what else uh, has uh, happened? Well, I've uh, changed my my setup here a little bit. Um, if you are familiar with the with the stream and with myself, and even if you just look around a bit, uh, you might notice that I'm into mechanical keyboards, and um, I really fell in love with a split. Uh, ergonomic keyboard that is even ortholinear which means that the keys are arranged in a grid instead of the staggered uh, traditional layout and uh, I really do enjoy writing on this keyboard it's uh, a keyboard that I've built a few weeks ago it's called Lily 58 and uh, I really enjoy typing on it uh, I really think that ortholinear keyboards are more ergonomic than the traditional layout that simply uh, was invented to basically slow typists down so the type um, hammers couldn't jam uh, back when we still had mechanical typewriters and um, when computers came about they simply kept the familiar layout so that uh, data typists sh uh, didn't have to relearn um, typing um, when they switched from a mechanical typewriter to a computer system. Uh, even though uh, now the QWERT or QWERT layout didn't really make any sense anymore and isn't really optimized for uh, typing in any language, to be honest. Um, so um, the author linear uh, layout makes more sense in my uh, view and um, Kevin S. Joe Burke, hey, how you are? How are you doing? I hope you're doing well. Um, welcome to Full Stack Live. Nice of you to drop by. 
Um, yeah, and um, so on top of switching to an author linear layout, I also switched the uh, the letter layout from the traditional QWERTY layout to what's called Colmac, where the letters are arranged in a different way. Um, actually, in a way that you can reach the most used letters and uh, symbols um, from the home row where your fingers normally rest. Uh, this has been quite a challenge. I've switched about two or three weeks ago and um, I'm slowly getting acquainted with the layout and you'll see me make lots of typing errors today. However, um, I realized that uh, switching back and forth between uh, Colmac and QWERTY simply for practical reasons, for example, using QWERTY here on stream um, just to not make as many errors, uh, actually throws me back in um, getting more familiar with the Colmac layout. So I decided to type Colmac um, for the foreseeable future and let's see um, how quickly I get back to my usual words per minute uh, numbers. So just in case you wonder why uh, what I'm typing here on screen doesn't match the letters on my keyboard, now you know why. Um, what else? Yeah, um, I also um, had to think about this stream um, in general, because um, uh, as you probably know, um, I was on and off quite, yeah, quite a lot in, in recent weeks, and uh, that's uh, something that uh, I needed to think about. And um, I might have taken doing this stream a little bit too seriously and making it another job. Um, and uh, that pressure that I put on myself uh, might have actually um, negatively impacted my motivation to do the stream in the first place. So um, I decided to uh, lay back a little bit and uh, relax and, um, uh, and simply see what, what comes of this stream and just do it for the fun of it instead of trying to reach certain goals in terms of viewer numbers and other things that don't seem as important um, as I might have made them look to myself. So um, I hope that will contribute to a, a more regular stream schedule for the coming weeks um, and uh, I appreciate any feedback in uh, how to do the stream, how to make changes that might um, uh, be improvements. So if there's anything that um, you think I should change or uh, do differently, let me know. If there is anything that you think should really stay the same, let me know too. Now, enough of the rambling here. Let's get things started and let's dockerize Ruby on rails. Now, here we are. Um, you can see I have define two goals for today. First of all, build a simple Docker image of a Rails application, just to demonstrate how Docker works in general. And um, then we'll take a closer look at the initial implementation and um, especially take a look at the disadvantages um, and uh, then improve on these um, uh, weaknesses and build something that will be really practical for daily use. Uh, what software am I using? I'm using OBS. I've tried different streaming applications. I've tried first. I started, of course, with OBS because it's free, and um, but I ran into problems um, at different times, uh, which then 
Yeah, for example, back then uh, there was a, a severe bug that affected web sources. So as soon as I wanted to integrate something uh, that gets pulled from a web source, like for example, the on-screen chat or um, uh, viewer alerts and things like that, um, OBS um, crashed. And of course, uh, that's not something you can build upon. So I decided to um, take out my wallet and licensed um, Telestream, uh, what's it called? See, I can't even remember what's it called. Um, what's it called? I can't remember. Let's let's find out. Where's my browser? Uh, Telestream. Screen f Wi Wirecast, exactly. Yeah, I licensed Wirecast, and that worked actually quite well. Well, after paying a few hundred dollars, uh, you can expect things to to work well. However, then I um, ran into performance issues, um, and I actually upgraded my iMac here to a, a more beefy um, model, and. Um, at that time, OBS had done a few upgrades and I gave it another try and it has been working fine so far since then. And uh, that's why I'm still using OBS at the moment. Uh, OBS has actually a few advantages over Wirecast and that's why I uh, stopped using Wirecast. Um, it was a good stopgap while OBS was misbehaving, but um, in terms of integrations, for example, with the Elgato Stream Deck and things like that, um, OBS really works quite nicely. So, um, yeah, let's go ahead and build a Docker image. Here we are uh, in my Rails Docker directory. At the moment it's still empty, so let's create a new Rails application. Um, at the moment I'm running uh, Ruby dash v Ruby 265 and we'll need this information later when we build our Docker image, but let's first create a new Rails application. Rails new. Um, let's call this Docker one. Docker one. Node.js not installed. Well, that is strange, but should be easy to uh, mitigate. Install Node.js, I guess. That is really strange because, uh, oh, I think the issue is something else. I think the issue is with this library here. We'll see if uh, reinstalling node will fix this. Let's do a brew, brew upgrade node. Uh, brew. I still have to think heavily which keys are what in this Colmac layout. Uh, 
I trained using ty uh, I trained typing um, prose, and that actually went quite well because uh, being able to anticipate what the next word is going to be really helps with typing. But um, uh, here, typing commands um, is still quite unfamiliar to my muscle memory. So I'll have to train a lot more and well, this stream is going to be one of the opportunities. FX, whatever that is, is missing. I'm really surprised that my development environment here is broken in that way. But let's uh, try and fix this. Uh, FX. Will it actually try to upgrade FX? It actually did. But let's try rehash to. Uh, Brew rehash even. Brew rehash. Oh, there's no rehash command. Okay. So let's go back to brew upgrade node. Okay. No, I guess I'll simply try and recreate this um, this project. Rm dash rf docker one. Rails new docker one. In order to run this Rails application, I could, of course, uh, run it locally uh, in here, and that should actually work. Let's try this. Rails server. It's running on localhost 3000. Localhost three thousand. Yep, it does work. Ruby two six five. Very nice. But that's not what we want. Why actually don't we want to run our Rails application locally, which seems to be the most simple uh, approach? Oh, let's, let's first catch up with, with chat. Um, Kevin asks, do you enjoy your Ergodox? It's actually not an Ergodox, it's a Lily 58, but it is uh, a split ergonomic keyboard and it's author linear like the Ergodox. Uh, the Ergodox even has more um, keys. Actually, um, I'm not even uh, using the number row up here. Um, uh, I do enjoy typing on this thing a lot. And uh, that's actually surprising to me because uh, I've built and bought a lot of keyboards, as you probably can see, and uh, some of them were quite expensive and are, and uh, they are 
um, worth the money. However, um, I do not enjoy any of these keyboards more than this Lily 58 with its simple acrylic um, plate and uh, bottom case. Um, it's not very uh, sophisticated in its technology or in its case and I probably would like to have um, a more high-end case or a, a keyboard with a more high-end finish. However, um, it probably will not type anything uh, else, uh, any different from, from the Lily 58 here. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I really do enjoy typing on this. It's very convenient and uh, even though Colmac, uh, the Colmac layout does slow me down quite a bit at the moment, I can actually see uh, my speed improving and um, having not to move your fingers around all over the place, simply because the layout forces you to, um, is really an advantage, I think. And I'm, I'm pretty sure and confident that I'll be able to reach my normal um, WPM uh, numbers uh, in due time and then write even more ergonomically than I did before. You're not using all 10 fingers. That's something that um, these keyboards actually force you to do. And um, uh, funnily enough, I've been touch typing for many, many years. However, switching to a split keyboard and switching uh, to a author linear keyboard actually um, uh, made me discover that I didn't um, actually teach myself proper touch typing um, where I reached with the wrong finger, for example, and um, that simply doesn't work with this author linear layout anymore because, um, uh, for example, if I'm I, here, the key below really is supposed to be typed with the um, uh, second finger and reaching over with the middle finger simply doesn't really work anymore which it did with the normal staggered layout so um, uh, I'm actually improving my touch typing even more um, than I did in the past two or three decades um, I really enjoy um, the way that my typing is getting both more comfortable and uh, more precise because we don't want what just happened to happen. Um, you mean uh, my my constant uh, typing errors? Right now you're typing somewhere around 80 to 90 WPM. That's my um, region, my normal region on QWERTY as well. Um, at the moment I'm at say 20 or something here on the author linear keyboard when I'm typing prose with um, uh, sensible words uh, in the terminal. I actually haven't done much terminal work since I switched to Colmac um, because I was taking time off. Uh, oh, um, okay, yeah, I'll get back to, to your uh, comment in a, in a minute. Um, yeah, so um, I need to train a little bit more. Um, the answer to why dockerizing an application is a good idea. What did happen? Uh, what, do you, uh, what do you mean? Uh, oh, you mean... Um, yeah, you're right. Um, that's what I was get, getting um, to anyway. Um, thank you for that. Um, so, as you saw, for some reason, my local software installation was um, wonky, and um, I wasn't able, even a, able to, to start a Ruby on Rails project. Um, I guess um, that's more or less inevitable, inevitable um, because um, somehow I have to spawn a new Rails project before I can actually get into Dockerizing it. But um, still, uh, that, that is actually one of the main reasons why you want to Dockerize your development environment. Um, what is Dockerizing in the first place? So Dockerizing means that you um, use what's called containers um, to isolate an application. Um, by using Docker, you can use capabilities in the Linux kernel 
um, that allow you to isolate a process or a group of processes from the rest of the operating system. Um, these processes can use their own file system, so everything, um, all the files that belong to your project are contained in a container. They are separate from your um, host systems file system. So there is um, a limited amount of interaction between your host system, your workstation and what's running inside a container. Um, and uh, that's something that you actually want because if you have multiple projects uh, each of these projects lives in their own bubble and uh, doesn't affect uh, the other projects. It might also have uh, slight security um, uh, advantages having everything in its own bubble uh, not being able to see other stuff um, but that's not my main concern why I'm running my development um, projects in containers. Um, another reason is, and we'll get to this uh, in detail, that um, applications like Ruby on Rails depend on uh, services like a database, for example. Most non-trivial uh, Ruby on Rails applications will use some kind of database, most likely Postgres. Um, and um, you'd have to install that um, database on your workstation as well, which is not too hard using something like Brew here on my Mac, uh, or it's even easier you, if, if you are running Linux as your host uh, operating system. However, um, even though it might be easy, you will hit a wall, for example, if you'd like to try different versions of the same database. So maybe um, your usual um, applications run with um, an older version of Postgres and you'd like to keep it that way without having to upgrade everything. However, for a new project, you need a newer version of Postgres because you are using a new feature that came with that version. And uh, now you are in a situation where you, you would have to run two versions of Postgres in parallel. And that is normally quite hard, doing that um, uh, natively on your um, host operating system. Uh, sometimes it's possible, but um, it will at least be complicated, if not uh, practically impossible. With Linux containers, it's easy because, as I said, these containers are isolated bubbles, different universes, separate from each other. And um, so there is no problem running uh, a service in one version with one application and uh, a different container running a different version for another project. Uh, so Docker will definitely give you more um, flexibility in terms of what you use in terms of services. And the more services your application consumes, for example, um, we'll, we might have to uh, add uh, a different data store like Redis to the mix. And um, now you'll have to run um, uh, Redis either on your host operating system or in a container and again running it in containers will be more convenient and uh, more simple and easy to manage because for example uh, Redis doesn't allow you uh, Redis isn't quite uh, a multi-tenant database where you can have different uh, databases for different uh, applications um, so while it would be quite easy to install Redis on my Mac here, for example. Um, it would always be the same instance uh, of Redis uh, all my projects talk to. And that, of course, can also lead to strange uh, side effects when uh, one application comes in conflict with another. Uh, having uh, with, with Docker containers, I can have as many Redis instances, again, in even multiple versions, as I want to. Kevin is right in, in saying version management could be done locally as well using a version manager sa such as asdfvm.com. 
However, if any of the tools you're using, such as Ruby, PostgreSQL, MySQL, or whatever, have their own dependencies, this can become tedious fairly fast. Also, uh, I haven't had any experience with ASDF so far, but the dash VM tells me that it's um, based on some kind of virtual machine. And um, of course, I could um, split my, my Mac into different virtual machines using a traditional VM platform, such as VirtualBox, or uh, VMware or something like that. Um, but that will be um, more complicated because um, these VMs are uh, also separate um, universes, so to speak, but um, they are actually um, simulated hardware. Um, so the setup is more complex and uh, takes more time and also the virtualization takes more resources in order to actually run uh, virtual computers in parallel, while um, containers only run isolated processes on your host operating system, on Linux. Uh, even on my Mac here, there is actually a VM running a Linux operating system that in turn then runs all my Docker containers, but it's a single Lin Linux instance, not uh, many, many uh, virtual machines. And um, so uh, Docker is much more lightweight than any virtual machine platform. Um, it doesn't go as far in separating things as uh, as VM platforms do. Okay, so um, let's um, stop the Rails process on my machine here and let's start dockerizing this. Of course, uh, you have to have Docker installed and running and let's make sure that's actually the case. I can actually ch test that by running uh, docker ps. I see it's not running, so let's uh, spin it up. Docker. It'll take a minute to spin up, and then we'll be able to use it. In the meantime, I'm going to um, build the docker configuration, which um, is a file appropriately named docker file. I think I'm going to use VS Code for that. Uh, that's my um, notes database. Let's uh, actually spin up a new window here and minimize. Oops. What's happening? Why am I in input mode? Uh, da, da, da. Here we go. Let's get this to screen stream size. And let's open my new Rails project. Projects, full stack live, Rails Docker, Docker 1. Here we go. <clears throat> uh, let's also uh, increase the zoom level a little bit. Uh, can I do this from here? Zoom in. Okay. I'll have a look at the ASDF project later, Kevin. Thanks for the link. always interested in alternatives. So uh, we'll have to create a new file which is called docker file with a capital D. Docker file. And docker file always starts with uh, the from statement and in this case we'll use a base image uh, because that's what from uh, 
defines a base image called Ruby because that's a Debian image that already, already has Ruby pre-installed. And I think it needs a colon and then the Ruby version. In this case, we'll use the same version I have locally, Ruby 2.6.5. Uh, VS Code tells me that uh, the colon here is actually not correct. Uh, we'll simply use this. Let's uh, spin up a uh, terminal and uh, let's see if we can actually build this image. Doing uh, docker build um, use uh, Jesus yeah muscle memory is failing me at the moment um, docker build uh, we'll use the tag docker one just as our project is named and we'll use the tag latest And then we'll define the local directory as a source directory. Apparently Docker is now running. And it sent 114 megabytes to the Docker daemon to actually build an image. And this image, since I only declared the base image here, will be identical to the base image. Um, there is nothing in this image that uh, belongs to our project here. We'll have to do that first. So, um, what am I going to do? I'll do a, uh, I'll create an application directory where we can install everything. So um, that's going to be run. Uh, and then we'll run a command uh, mk dear slash app and we'll declare that the work dear interestingly enough uh, VS code already lets me autocomplete this which makes typing much easier and uh, now we can actually run or copy our project into the Docker container. Yeah, as that's quite fitting, but I mean add. Diego, how are you doing? Welcome back to Full Stack Live. Happy to have you here. Yes, long time no see. Uh, I'm doing well. Um, I was a little bit burnt out in, in recent weeks or even months, um, thanks to the whole COVID situation, but I'm getting better. Uh, uh, I just came back from uh, five uh, days uh, of holiday with my family, which in turn was possible because um, I got ourselves um, a new car. Uh, I didn't own a car in 14 years and normally that didn't uh, uh, create any major issues because we always were able to use public transport or rent a car but with uh, the whole covid situation that simply went out of the window quickly and um, uh, we found ourselves being constrained to basically walking or cycling distance and uh, that definitely contributed to my to my burnout to my feeling of being locked in and uh, uh, getting the car while very expensive um, was uh, definitely uh, a good decision yeah so uh, I guess um, Taking a look at my stream schedule can actually tell you my mental state. If I'm not streaming, something is wrong. 
and that I'm streaming today uh, is a good sign. So, um, the most straightforward thing would be to simply copy um, the current working directory where I invoke a docker build uh, and copy everything into app. Okay, and that actually should even be enough to, to run the container because the Ruby image also has um, the uh, command predefined. Uh, if uh, it finds a Rails application in the work directory, uh, it'll automatically start it when the container starts. So I think uh, running uh, the container should actually run our Docker um, or our Rails application. Let's give this a try. So uh, Docker uh, run uh, run. Uh, we'll run it in an interactive terminal. So it's dot i t. Um, and then the image name. Or oh, we can even add rm so it gets deleted right after running. Uh, and let's run um, the Docker one. latest and that should oops no that spins up a ruby an interactive ruby uh, shell that's interesting i did not expect that maybe they've changed that okay so we actually do have to uh, define the command that is going to be run um, and we can do that by adding um, yeah actually what do we have to run let me take a look at um, one of my existing docker files Um, that's a fine. the box dashboard docker file. Oh, I can see why uh, it doesn't work. Yeah, we not only have to install our application, we also have to run um, bundle install and everything. So um, we'll actually have to, after installing our application, um, we should actually uh, install bundler. So that's uh, done with another run command. Run gem install bundler. If you wonder why I can't type, I've switched my keyboard layout to Cole Mac and I'm far from being familiar with it. Bundler then uh, we'll actually run bundle install run bundle install let's see if that wait I can't use that uh, I have to build it again 
You are right. Um, I also need to install Yarn and Node. Let's uh, prepare for that. Uh, these installations should be done quite early in the Docker file. Uh, I'm intentionally making a few uh, novice mistakes here and I'll improve on them later, but I'd like to um, build this up step by step. Um, so, for example, the gem install bundler we should do quite early because Docker actually um, has what's called a layered file system and each of these statements in the Docker file will um, create a new layer that only contains the changes, the delta, um, to the previous layer. And um, as soon as one of the layers needs to change, and Docker has several ways to, to detect that, um, all the layers that are stacked on top of this changed layer needs to be rebuilt too. Um, so having certain things done earlier in the process um, will actually prevent uh, the uh, build process to run unnecessarily long. So let's um, actually move this here. So we have this section up here where we do the basic <coughs> preparations, creating our app directory and installing Bundler. Then we copy our application to the container. The, among these files also we will be our gem file. So we can now run Bundle install. Um, if we want to install something like Node or uh, Yarn, um, we also need to, we should do that uh, in this uh, preparation phase up here. YBN, hello, how are you doing? Welcome to Full Stack Live. Happy to have you here. Um, so, uh, in order to make things easier, I'll actually uh, add a folder to my workspace here with my. existing project wait uh, go to development dashboard add that because now I can steal a lot of things from the pre-existing docker file here especially this part where I uh, set up the uh, package source for yarn and install everything that's necessary with uh, um, node and stuff so let's uh, copy that and uh, move that even earlier up here As you can see, installing all these gems definitely takes some time. And that's going to create problems um, with my most recent changes here. Because now I've changed the underlying layers by adding one, two, three more layers uh, at the bottom. Which means all the layers that come after that needs to be redone. So if I run my uh, docker build again just to have node and stuff available not only will it actually um, run all that stuff here it will also copy my application again and run bundle install again which will again take an eternity 
So uh, that will quickly become a, a huge nuisance. Oibian uh, just got an internship. Congrats! As a Ruby on Rails developer two weeks ago after studying and watching my streams. Awesome! That sounds great. I'm very happy to see that. Great, great. I'm, I'm really happy. See, these are the things that uh, uh, really give me... Uh, uh, what, it's what is it called? Um, uh, tailwind. Like the CSS framework. Because in recent weeks I was... I, I basically got imposter syndrome and uh, asked myself, why am I even doing these streams? Um, there are only a handful of people or two handfuls of people watching me. And um, even some student uh, starting to learn their first programming language can get 40, 50, 90 viewers. So um, is it really worth the time and the effort? Am I making a fool of myself? Um, and uh, happily, I, I was able to, uh, to throw these doubts away and uh, simply say, well, let's just enjoy ourselves and uh, have fun with the people that actually show up, people like you. And uh, I'm so happy to see that YBN um, made progress and uh, at least things that I did contribute a little bit, which, would me, which makes me very proud. Thank you for that. And thanks for the praise, Diego. Uh, I'm quite happy that I have these headphones on so you can't see how red my ears are getting. Okay, so uh, Kevin is, uh, pointed out that I actually don't have to do the MK deer because work deer is uh, intelligent enough to actually create the directory if it doesn't yet exist. Uh, that's one small improvement, however. Um, now we'll have to deal with the issue of bundle install basically getting run every time we make any changes to the uh, previous layers here. These layers up here aren't much of an issue because uh, they will change only if um, the uh, public key for the package uh, repository of yarn changes, which doesn't probably happen often. Um, it um, would change if we change the um, list of packages that we are installing here, which also doesn't happen very often. We are not going to change the work here again at all. And uh, so gem install bundler will also not have to be run again um, in the near future. However, this part here will change every time we change any file in our project. Docker probably does some checksumming or things like that and will detect any change that we make to our project and uh, make sure that uh, these changes get copied to our work there, uh, as well, which will invalidate this layer, which will trigger the following layer and get us another round of bundle install, which will probably stall us for another five minutes or so. And that's not something we can have. Unruly Oddfixer, welcome to Fusak Live. Happy to have you here. Uh, it's so good to, to see all you regulars again. I'm really happy to be back. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. Uh, you have a lot to share with help us be better developers. <sighs> Thank you so much. From the heart. So, how can we prevent bundle install from running every time we make any change to our uh, application here? Well, from the pure logic of things that run earlier in the process of building this image, um, run less often, uh, 
we could simply say, well, yeah, let's let's run bundle install. Uh, wait, uh, let's run bundle install earlier, right? But that's not going to work because uh, with a fresh, freshly built image, uh, there is no gem file that we can use to run bundle install on. Uh, this gem file only comes with this final uh, step here, when we co uh, copy our whole project directory to our work dir. Um, so what we have to do is actually have another add step for the gem file and the gem file dot lock. So let's do that. We'll say add gem file to slash app and we'll do another add gem file dot log to slash app then we'll run bundle install and then finally we'll copy our whole project over so just to be sure when will bundle install run again well, if something of this pre-installation changes, for example, if a new bundler gem becomes available, and then it makes sense to run bundle install again. Um, if the gem file changes, if the gem file dot lock changes, and of course we need to run bundle install again if that happens. However, any changes elsewhere in our project will not trigger bundle install again because they this uh, change uh, happens after bundle install has already been executed. So finally we can run build one more time And bundle install win run one final time now. Using copy instead of add, um, let's find out because uh, I do actually remember um, something like that. And me using add might actually be a remnant of olden times. You can see even in, in my um, production application I actually am using copy. So yeah, and here I'm using add. Uh, I think copy is... yes, yes I do remember now. Thanks for the comment and thanks for the feedback. Uh, copy is a little bit more simple than add. So if I'm copying single files uh, if I want to transfer single files into my Docker image, uh, using copy is more efficient. Uh, however, um, if you want to import a whole directory like I'm doing here, um, uh, add is the better alternative. So um, uh, here where I simply uh, reuse the command, let's replace this. Uh, now I'm... wait... Uh, Jeez. Copy and here, let's do the same here. No copy, which unfortunately will trigger another build run. So let's uh, actually um, abort this run and run it again. And I still uh, have in the back of my mind that we'll have to also run yarn. But first, let me demonstrate that uh, this is a much better setup than the single ad we had before. By letting this finish, 
and if I run build again, it should simply reuse the existing image layers because uh, nothing changed in my application. Gem files didn't change, so bundle install doesn't have to run. Project didn't change, so uh, even the final add statement should not trigger a layer rebuild. But for that, we'll have to be patient one more time for Bundler to finish. It's a good thing to, to uh, go through these steps um, even if I've done them before, because as you can see, um, it's it's hard to remember all the stuff that went into an existing application, um, and especially remembering why they went into there. Um, and uh, it's a good preparation for myself because I'd like to turn uh, or to use this information, these learnings, to create a YouTube video and an article on my blog. By the way, speaking of YouTube, if you would be so kind, uh, if I can actually uh, type YT, Jesus, um, uh, YT. If you would be so kind to subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, which still doesn't have enough subscribers for me to get a proper URL with my uh, channel name, um, I would highly appreciate that. Um, uh, on a, for in, in order to get a proper YouTube URL, you need to have um, 100 subscribers, and I still have only about 70. So if you could help push me over the limit, that would be great. Now, um, I can actually already take a look at what we did here well it's basically the same um, approach I copy the package JSON and the yarn.lock to my container and uh, instead of bundler install I run yarn install so we can actually uh, already copy this uh, that's uh, shift V and then uh, Y I can tell you using Vim with the Colmac keyboard layout is quite a challenge because of course uh, HJKL aren't where they used to be and all the other uh, letters have, uh, have been jumbled around too. So yeah, I'm not sure if I'm going to stick with using all that. Um, it'll probably depend on how quickly I can get proficient with these changes. Uh, however, if uh, nothing else, they'll definitely train my brain. And uh, at my age, uh, you, you should take a few brain challenges just in order to keep diseases like Alzheimer's at bay. So now uh, we've actually built our whole Docker image. And uh, if you pay attention to the build process, you will notice that um, uh, Docker outputs these hashes with every step. And these are the IDs of the file system layers. And as you can see here, it's telling us, well, this run apt-get so-and-so um, uh, did not change from the previous build step. So it's using the cached layer that already existed. Same here, same here. Only for bundle install, it detected changes in the gem file. So um, it needs to run again. And that shouldn't happen when we run bun build docker build again. Let's see if that's actually the case. I hope so. Don't make me look like a liar. Yeah, you can see the build immediately finished by using the cached layers from the previous build, build process.
Yes, I'll be happy to uh, upload my recording to YouTube. Um, the recording actually is even in uh, 1080p, so you can watch it in full resolution. Alrighty, so uh, I count that as a success. Uh, now we'll have to uh, paste in our yarn steps as well. Uh, by pasting this after the bundle install uh, command here, uh, we can actually prevent bundle install from running again. Um, all, only the add step here needs to be redone now, which means this build will still run quite quickly. Oh, shoot. Uh, why does it run again now? That's strange. Huh. Why? Gem file and gem file dot lock got changed. There's no using cache here. Why did they get changed? Oh, I think I know why. Does it have to do with the bundler version that runs inside the container? Because it's different from my local one? That's strange. These files shouldn't have changed. Did you see me change them? Let's... Uh, let's take a look at uh, the actual file. Um, dash... Uh, no, not A, it's... Uh, Come on, <laughs> dash L. Uh, well, that's strange. They haven't changed in almost an hour. Hmm, no idea what Docker is doing here. Somehow it thought Oh, I know what's happening. I know what's happening. Okay, so see, that's something that I would have forgotten um, had I written my article from memory. So, uh, what did happen is the uh, file system in the container is in no way connected to my local file system. Which means only these copy commands and this final add command basically synchronize the contents of my container with my project directory here. And um, running bundler inside the container changes, uh, well, at least the gemfile.lock file. It might actually change that. Uh, I don't think it changes the gem file, and I wonder why that also did not get cached. However, um, as an explanation, I think uh, what uh, I'm assuming is correct. So if bundle install changes the gemfile.lock file, maybe someone released a, a new uh, uh, version of a gem that got pulled. Um, th that will change the gemfile.lock file inside the container after it being copied to the container. So uh, the version in the container is updated, my local version is not. If I run docker build again now, docker will detect that the version inside the container is not in sync with my older version in my project directory and copy the older version inside the container, run bundle install again, which will 
update the container local gemfile.log. And so basically we are getting into an uh, endless loop here of Bundler being run all the time because every time I, I build this container, uh, an older version of the log file gets copied inside, requiring a new bundle install and so on and so on. So what I need to do is to actually um, connect my Docker container with my workstation here in a way that changes inside the container get synced back to my project directory. So if, for example, a gemfile.log gets updated, it needs to be updated on my workstation as well, because, of course, I want these changes to persist, I want to commit them to my Git repository, and so on. And um, that is not going to happen um, if we don't uh, sync uh, these, uh, the, the container with my workstation. And that's done using a, a Docker feature named volumes where you can tell docker well um, take a certain directory on my uh, workstation here and basically mount it inside the container instead of having a local copy um, and that way um, changes that docker makes inside the container get reflected on my workstation oh hey julian hello happy saturday to you sir Dota 2 Attitude is there as well. Welcome to Full Stack Live. Happy to have you here. Ah, it's so good to be back. Now, um, the only thing that I uh, find where my explanation is lacking is that we are still not running the container, we are only building the container image. And during build, I don't think volumes uh, even play a role here. Uh, I'm using the Ruby image as a base image here. Even though the Ruby image is not one of the leanest images out there, I find it quite convenient and uh, since we are talking about a development environment here uh, and not a production environment where we run hundreds of instances of this image, I don't think using anything else uh, would have a huge advantage here. You also have to do user stuff to bundle install, so you aren't root, right? No, uh, yes, I am actually. Um, and you're right, that's uh, um, something we have to take into consideration here. By default, uh, everything here runs as root, and that's why I probably, uh, for example, don't have to use sudo to run apt-get here, um, because everything here gets run as uh, root, and even my application will actually be run as root later. Um, for a development environment, that might be okay. Uh, it's probably not best practice and that's something that uh, we should uh, probably uh, fix later when we have the basics down. So let me actually uh, add this to my notes. Um, uh, we sh wait. Sh run our application as a non root user. I'm typing very slowly because um, I've switched my keyboard layout to Colmac, which I hope is going to pay off some time in the future.
If this is for dev, I wouldn't bundle install for what it's worth. I uh, would probably assign the node modules as a volume instead. It'll be faster than a manual file copy. That's an interesting idea. Haven't thought of that yet. I guess my approach is a mix of building an application or building a Docker image for production, where you probably will want to run bundle install, so the image is self-contained, and running something only for development, where you could actually um, use a local directory where you vendor all your gems into, and then simply use the volume mechanism that I've described earlier to actually import that into the um, image and that would also prevent these issues with bundle install running when you don't want it to. That's actually a good idea and I'll definitely cover that in my article and video as well. Um, so let me think um, which route I'd like to take now. Um, since I've already taken this route. Let me actually finish it. And then we'll make a few optimizations for development by using volumes. And now I actually remember that we should define a volume inside here, shouldn't we? Uh, why do I not do that in my dashboard? Docker file. Oh, that's because uh, in the dashboard project I'm using Docker, Docker Compose, where I actually define the volume. Since we are not using Docker Compose yet, I wonder if that information about volumes shouldn't rather belong into here. However, by doing that, I'll turn this Docker file into a development Docker file. Because in, in a production environment, we're not going to use volumes. But we're talking about development here, so let's focus on that. So, um, I guess that's something that I'd like to do quite early in the process. Maybe... Yeah. That's something that I'd like to do early, even though it means I'll have to run bundler install again. Um, I'd like to actually define a volume here. Volume... Um, and uh, that's going to be... How, how is this uh, defined, actually? Let's uh, check out the details. Stalker... Volume. Oh, we're getting there with typing. Still slow, but my precision is improving. There's the dash V command line option. That's all the more complex stuff. Maybe I should have looked for docker file volume here. Docker file. Wait. Here, volume. Volume instruction creates a mount point with a specified name and marks it as holding external mounted volumes from native host or other containers. Value can be a JSON array or a plain string with multiple arguments such as volume var log or db. For more information, examples, mounting instructions, share directories via volumes.
volumes. Uh, the host directory is declared at container runtime. Okay, so I declare a certain directory basically as a mount point and have to then uh, give a host site directory when I run the container. Okay. Okay, so you could also use multi-stage builds for managing development and production from a single Docker file. That's something that I'm going to look into as well, yeah. Uh, but probably not today. Defining volumes in a Docker file is limited to unarmed volumes. You can only mount host directories and named volumes via Compose. So the volume would be defined in the Docker Compose and I'd only be built the Docker file to Compose. Compose up or Compose build, yes. <laughs> unnamed instead of unarmed, yeah, unnamed volumes. That's the way I did things I was messing with the Docker files, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe we should actually introduce uh, Docker Compose at this point because um, that'll make things much easier for us. So let's uh, actually get rid of this. And create a new file called docker-compose.yaml. Do, do, docker-jesus-compose.yaml. And we can steal something from my existing project here as well. Let's uh, go ahead and... Uh... Ah, that's where I also defined the start command and that's why my Rails application didn't start earlier. And here we have the volume definition. So far that's all we need. So we say Docker Compose version 3, which is the uh, most current API services at the moment is on the app container. We build the local working directory. That's the command that's going to be run in the end, uh, which the image does not by itself. That was a mistake by, on, on my side. We'll um, map the internal port 3000 to uh, the host machine uh, onto a um, port that's managed by Docker so it doesn't conflict with any other application and we mount the current um, working directory into the slash app directory. So that's going to make a change to how this process works because um, now my slash app directory that I'm using as a work there here in my docker file will not become a copy of my project directory since I'm mounting my project directory inside the container um, the work here will actually be my project directory and that will prevent uh, the issues we had with the gem file getting updated or the gem file.lock getting updated in the container without that being reflected on my project directory locally here. So let's uh, now use, instead of docker build, we'll use docker compose build. Um, docker dash compose build app build app since docker compose is going to manage multiple containers and container images for our project um, especially when we add a database and other things um, I can and should um, declare the service or container that I'm that I'd like to build here so I actually 
reference the name of my service, which is arbitrarily app. I also could, could uh, name it Rails or something like that. So let's run this. Thanks for dropping by Dota 2 Attitude. I hope you have a great weekend, uh, have a lot of fun uh, coding yourself, and uh, I hope to see you soon. That's actually another valuable uh, learning that I uh, got here which is, um, it does not really make sense to start only building the Docker file and leaving Docker Compose out of the equation um, and only adding it later. Um, that's what That was my intention, that I would add Docker Compose to the mix only uh, when it comes to adding a PostgreSQL database or something like that. Um, in terms of these um, of this volume integration with my local directory here, uh, it is a much better idea to introduce Docker, the Docker command and the Docker compose command uh, right from the start, and um, make use of this volume mapping here. And again, uh, if someone uh, watching this uh, is not familiar enough with Docker and does not really um, understand what I'm talking about here, uh, feel free to ask in Twitch chat. I'll be happy to explain this uh, in more detail if uh, that helps you understand things better. I'm curious to see if the gem file or gemfile.log actually gets updated, and uh, we'll take a look at that um, after bundle install has actually run. Because now that um, the app directory in my container is actually identical to my project directory here on my Mac, um, at least it's kept identical by Docker for Mac, um, because uh, Docker actually runs in a Linux VM and uh, Docker for Mac has to do the heavy lifting of syncing my um, macOS directory here to the Linux VM running the Docker container. Um, uh, it's not actually identical, but uh, Docker for Mac makes sure it is identical in the end. We should see if the date stamp of these files have changed on my Mac here. Let's also make a note uh, as a next step. I'd like to pick up uh, what uh, Kevin mentioned earlier. Um, investigate, oh dear, I'm even forgetting what uh, I had already learned in typing here. Investigate um, on build state man. for a div slash prod docker file. Well, I guess uh, we've already gone beyond building a simple Docker image. Uh, now we are in the phase of building a good Docker image.
here we are and uh, I guess docker compose up should now actually get us a running uh, docker application let's first check the timestamps so the previous timestamps were um, 425 something so 1625 let's take another look at that uh, L S still 1626 so the files did not actually change. Hmm. That's strange. Let me switch back and run another build here. Let's see if that actually makes use of all the caching. Otherwise, there is something. Yeah. It used all caches down to the application layer, so uh, it went quite quickly. I'm now going to run Docker Compose up in a separate uh, terminal, just so I can run it in the foreground. Docker dash compose up. That's something I was, I have been struggling a few times in the past, and I think I'm going to follow um, this comment here. Uh, please change check yarn integrity to false in your webpacker config file. Because uh, I think I, I read that um, this issue here is actually a non-issue, and by uh, not checking the yarn integrity um, is actually okay. Um, because we actually in building this container we did do yarn install um, so running another yarn install should not be necessary um, let me actually copy that and set that to false in my config webpacker yaml config webpacker yaml hello C films how are you doing welcome to full stack live Check yarn integrity is actually false. You must be kidding me. Oh, I hate you. Oh, wait, uh, that's the default, but the development might... Yeah, development uh, has it differently. So let's change that. Come on. Change that to false. which should actually enable us to, to run this application now. Doing great, that's great. Yeah, I'm doing fine as well, thank you for asking. Um, I just came back from five days of holidays with my family at a nice rural place in the west of Ireland where uh, my family went horse riding and I got to watch YouTube and relax and the food folks the food was so delicious uh, we chose this uh, um, location which is named Sleeve Orti um, also because they offer organic um, homegrown food and oh god it was heaven um, delicious breakfast with uh, home-baked bread and fresh goat's cheese and oh I, I'm getting hungry simply talking about it uh, it was really really great and yes now I'm I'm really relaxed and uh, well nourished I haven't stepped on a on a scale yet uh, and I hope I did not gain too much weight but even if I did it was well worth it okay Application is running uh, locally inside the container. It's running on, on uh, port 3000 as is the default. However, that doesn't mean I can actually access port 3000 on my machine here. Um, I first need to find out where Docker chose to map this. And I can do this by running um, 
docker dash compose port port and the service or container which is named app nope uh, print the public port uh, I need to specify that I want to know where port 3000 actually is mapped because there could be multiple ports that are exposed by the container so uh, app uh, 3000 so container port 3000 is mapped to port 32769 on my machine here and by going there we should again see the rails application you I'm not a foodie I just like good food <laughs> I guess everyone enjoys good food so uh, and uh, we we actually um, uh, uh, make uh, use a lot of organic food uh, in preparing meals here in the house as well however having it prepared for you uh, is definitely an improvement unfortunately that's limited to a few days of holidays <laughs> And I'm getting more and more hungry. I can tell that uh, I'm nearing the six o'clock deadline. Uh, I actually did not have lunch today. And uh, that's a violation of my rule not to start streaming hungry. I wasn't hungry when I started, but now I definitely am. So don't expect me to go beyond my six o'clock limit. However, um, this is running nicely and um, let me see, where did we get today? We have a nicely working and still simple Docker file here. We have the simple Docker Compose YAML file that will allow us to add additional services here for databases and other stuff that we need to depend on. And that's going to be one of the next steps. However, there is one thing that's often overlooked. And uh, in order to demonstrate that, let me go back to my docker build command. Because that will illustrate what I'm getting at. So uh, let's go to docker. Docker blank build here. And exactly what's happening now is what I'm getting at. It's sending the build complex. I'm, I'm, I, let me interrupt that. It's sending the build context, which uh, in other words means sending your project directory, all the files that are relevant to the Docker daemon. In my case, where I'm running a Mac, means it needs to transfer all these files into the Linux VM that's actually running Docker, and then um, it uh, needs to copy that stuff um, into the um, uh, Docker container as well. And um, these are 144 megabytes. And it's strange even that even Rails with all its um, files amounts to more than 100 megabytes. And that's because my working directory contains more stuff than just the Rails source code. For example, There's also the .git directory where uh, git stores all my repository information. And that's not really a small directory, I guess. So let's find out um, how much um, 
this directory alone takes up. We'll use um, dot sh if I can type it um, to find out the sum of the disk space taken up in human readable form. And well, it's actually only 68k, but still, um, it will become more. Uh, it will become much more um, when we keep working on our uh, project here. Same goes for the log directory, where we actually don't need to uh, import all the logs that I'm having locally here into the container. I might want to take a look at the logs that the container actually generates. So we might actually use the log directory as a volume as well. Well, it's still part of the volume, so yeah, that's already covered. But still, uh, we, we don't yet have a log directory, do we? Uh, well, we do have one, but I'm not sure if it takes a lot of place now. A uh, lot of space. No, nope, it does not. But still, I guess uh, you get what I'm pointing out here. Uh, there are certain directories that you definitely do not want to have inside your container. This might actually even have security implications if you copy something into the container that definitely does not belong in a uh, container that you use in production. And uh, that's why um, there is a mechanism that tells Docker to ignore certain directories when it is um, gathering its build complex context. Um, and uh, so there is actually a dot docker ignore file where you can say, well, please do ignore my git directory, for example. Let's see if this makes a visible difference. Previously it was uh, 144. I guess now it's been still 144, so no change here. I wonder why. It should at least make a little bit of a change. Oh yeah, there's another thing that definitely does not need to be added to the container, which is the node modules directory. That will probably be a huge chunk because we are running yarn install inside the container when we build it anyway. Uh, Fooless Nabel noticed it before me. Hey, Fooless Nabel, welcome to Fullstack Live. Good to have you here already making great suggestions, even though um, uh, I keep not seeing them. Yeah, it's the size of the Library of Babel or Alexandria here. Um, uh, so let's add that, uh, which is a uh, node uh, underscore modules. So let's give this another try now. Oh, come on. Still. This is strange. This is strange. The that's a uh, wait. D D U. Node modules. That's one hundred and seven megabytes. That is probably uh, most of the context that I'm importing here, which is really not necessary. Uh, but why does it 
still import that. Maybe my syntax for the docker ignore file is not quite correct. Let's find out. Um, docker ignore. Docker file reference. There's even an example docker ignore file for Rails. Maybe you can steal a little bit from here. It still says .git dot git ignore sometimes they use uh, wildcards but uh, most of the time it definitely looks the same as mine yeah slash log slash temp should be ignored .env should be ignored if you're using the .env gem. Especially if you're running a production container, that should not be included. But uh, for a development container, you probably will need it. Maybe I'm missing the slashes here. So slash dot bundle, vendor bundle. Let's try adding a slash here. And here, um, and let's add the other directories as well. So we want to ignore TMP. We want to ignore log. Save that and uh, run Docker build again. What's going on? Something that I'm overlooking here. Really strange. It's dot docker ignore. Hmm. Git ignore dot io. Yes, uh, I think I've already used that actually. That's a great resource for getting uh, ignore files. Speaking of JavaScript, let me go on a rant about the VPN solution. Big Bear Company uses Electron to drive a small icon in the menu bar. That's five Chrome processes running in the background for a really minimal feature. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're rightfully angry. Having an Electron application simply to uh, create such a small UI element really sounds like overkill. And shouldn't take a, a developer long to program that uh, uh, natively with, with uh, say, Swift or something. But yeah, let's simply grab the thing that comes to mind first, I guess. We probably should use wildcards here to still keep the directory, but not the files inside the directories. Let's copy this wholesale. Let's also add a comment here. JavaScript. I think my typing gets worse when I'm hungry. Probably because my focus gets worse when I'm hungry. JavaScript libraries, node modules. You know what? Maybe 
this message just isn't an indicator for what actually gets added to the Docker container. I think that might actually be uh, Docker for Mac. Um, simply sending the project directory to the VM. So uh, the VM has everything available, but in later stages, when it comes to adding stuff um, to the container, it will actually create a smaller image than before. So maybe I just did not um, use the right indicator. I probably should have simply checked the final image size. And I guess that's something that I'll prepare for next time, because I really need to get something in my stomach. It's uh, six o'clock here, and uh, so um, at least we have come quite a way. We have a running um, Docker container. I'll upload this video to YouTube so you can reference it later. Let me again um, get you the... Uh, YouTube URL of my channel, which is still quite unreadable. So if you could give me a subscription over there, uh, I would highly appreciate it because when I reach 100 subscribers, I'll be able to get a more readable URL with my channel name. Um, and uh, I'll be back on uh, Tuesday, probably. That's at least my next scheduled slot. Um, and um, we'll build... Uh, on what I've done today by uh, adding more services and getting um, more clarity about the image size issue here. That's it for today. Uh, let me see if there is someone we can raid. Team. Yeah, here we go. You know what? Let's raid Seeker Player. Brandon has been doing great streams lately. Let's find out what he is doing this time. All right, so uh, let me enter that here, slash ray, ray, duh. Seek a player. All right, folks, so I hope you had fun. I definitely did. Thanks for all the great feedback. Uh, I'm happy to, to have all of you and I highly appreciate you dropping by. If you don't yet follow the stream, please do so. And um, maybe also give me a follow over on Twitter where I'm at GWIS. I hope you're going to have a great weekend and uh, I'll see you next week. Until then, take care.